scientists, scientists aren't going to like this teaching I'm about to do. People who, who believe in science, they're not going to like it either. Now, some science, like gravity, when they created gravity, saw gravity, you know, that kind of science is, is one thing. They have a lot of good science that way. But um, the science I'm going to be preaching against is those who, who believe we came from apes or that the world, the earth has been here for a million years. That's the science I'm going to be going against. Not me. The Word of God is going to be shown. You have philosophers out there who say, you can't prove that 2 plus 2 is 4, right? There's people out there who say that. You can't prove that. But when they were young, they knew the answer to that. But then they went to college, and they got so smart, they forgot the answer to 2 plus 2. Seriously. This is what colleges do to you. They brainwash you into whatever, you're, whatever field you're going into. You get so smart, you forget the simple things. Back when the Roman Catholics ruled under a king, they said the universe evolved around the earth. But then later they found out that wasn't true, that the universe evolved around the sun. And scientists at that time went crazy when they heard that. I mean, they didn't believe the Catholics, but they went with it. But then they found out that the uh, universe evolves around the sun. They were like, you know, science and scientists don't believe in the Bible on creation, which I'm going to show that. They don't believe much in the Bible anyway, but they're totally against creation. If you was to keep up with science in the world, you'll find that if about every 30 to 40 years, scientists, they change their theory on something. Well, we found this, and because we found this, that changes that. They're always changing things. Well, guess what? God doesn't change anything. It's always been the same with Him from the beginning to the end. He doesn't change anything. That's who we count on. If we were to count on scientists, we can't, because they're always changing their mind. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 and 21, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babbling, in opposition of science falsely so called which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Timothy is saying, guard against those, not to fall into their uh, godless, foolish decisions they make, which we have many men out there that do that, and that's what I'm going to be teaching on, on these scientists. They oppose what the Lord says because of their so-called knowledge. Some people have wondered from the faith because of that. This is what it's talking about in these verses. A lot of what scientists believe in is based on assumptions. Verse 20 says their lack of knowledge proves that they're not 100% sure on what they believe. And we know that. We see that. Praise God. We have a God that does not teach us by assumptions. And what he says is true and forever. And it doesn't change. So we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the word created here, in Hebrew, it means bara, which means it was created from absolutely nothing. So God created the heavens and earth from absolutely nothing. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now before I go any further, I want to point something out. Since I said these things about the scientists. In Mark chapter 10, you don't have to go there, I'm just going to read them to you. In Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 7, in the beginning of these verses, it's speaking about divorce. The Lord is speaking about divorce in these verses. And in verse 6 and 7, it says... But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Now remember, the topic is divorce. So we're talking about a man and a woman. Right here, if you just read verse 6, God made them male and female. He could have been talking about animals. But God, God is going to show us, no, I'm talking about people. Because the topic is divorce. And not only that, it says, and a man shall leave his father and mother. So 
you have people, believe it or not, showing that male and female here, it could have been anything. But they don't read the verses above it. They don't read the verse below it. It's plainly talking about people. We didn't come from apes. We were man and woman. Not just male and female. Like I said, if, it, if he would have just said male and female, well, then you could think, well, those could be apes. But no, we're talking about people here. That's why we, uh, I say it over and over. Read above and read below before you make any decisions on what that verse is talking about. God said he created man in his, in his own image. Well, what was the image of God then? Well, in John chapter 4, verse 24, it says that God is a spirit. And then later we'll see that he did take on an image of a man. But at that time, God was just a spirit. That's, so we didn't evolve from apes. God said from the very beginning. He said, it, but from the beginning. So from the, from the beginning, it was man and woman. This, this is mainly for those who still believe we evolved from apes. Verse 3. And God said, and also let me just say this. You see how simple that is? If you just read these verses, you see how easy and simple it is to, sh to for God to show us, okay, look, this is what I did. Now, how in the world are we going to get apes out of that? Yeah. In the beginning, created God man, made, created male and female. And if the topic is about divorce, well, animals don't get divorced. <laughs> Amen? So it's really simple. You just got to read. People don't know how to read. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, if we notice, God is creating everything by just His Word. He didn't work it. He didn't make it by hand. He just says it by, by, by Word. And God said, He just said it. Let there be light, and there was light. Verse 4. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God, and God divided the light from the darkness. Notice that God, from here on, says everything He created is good. From here on, he says it's good. And then the, the last, the sixth day, he's going to say it was very good. And there's a meaning for that. Verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. That was the first day. Now, the word day in Hebrew means yom. Yom means a 24-hour period, or it could mean a week or it could mean a thousand years. It could mean either one of them. And I say a thousand years because the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, that's the millennium. How long is the millennium? A thousand years. So the, the word day can mean a, a thousand years or it can mean a 24 hour period. That's what the word yom means in Hebrew. The Lord knows we're not too smart. Okay? He knows that. That's why he that's why he said at the end of this verse, he says, And the evening and the morning was the first day. Can you get an evening and the morning from a thousand years? What, you have a thousand evenings and a thousand mornings? No, he said, The evening and the morning was the first day. That's a day, a 24-hour day. Now, in Hebrew, there is a word, and it's pronounced, if I pronounce it right, Olam. Olam which means 24-hour period, uh, a period of uncertainty. So if this is what the Lord wanted us to, to take day as, as an uncertain amount of time, He would have used the word olam in Hebrew. But He used the word yom, and yom does, can mean 24 hours, and here in these verses, it does mean 24 hours. There was an evening and a day. That's one day. He said that's the first day. Another way we know it's more than <clears throat> it's not more than 24 hours by the order he by the order he created everything the plants were created the third day the sun was created the fourth day the birds was created on the fifth day and the insects were created on the sixth day now scientists try to prove that that day can mean an extended amount of time but that can't be true and the reason the, the lord and I'm, the reason the lord put it this way so we would think a little bit well, if he created the plants the third day, but he didn't create the sun until the fourth day, are we saying that the plants survived thousands or a thousand years without the sun? Hmm? That's what they're saying. If, if, if each day is like a thousand years, they're saying plants grew without the sun for a thousand years. 
<clears throat> the birds. The birds were on the on the fifth day, and the insects that birds eat wasn't created till the sixth day. So birds went without food for a thousand years. You see how ridiculous this is? Yeah. They don't know how to read. I mean they it plainly says here, God put it that way. And I'm sure he put it that way to show us, hey, I'm talking about a 24-hour period. That plant had sun the next day. Yeah. That bird had insects to eat the next day. Amen? Mm -hmm. Scientists that believe this way, they're not very smart. <laughs> they're really, seriously, if we look at it, they are not very smart at all. Right. Now, they say the Grand Canyon, which Jody and I saw that. They had signs saying how long it, it took millions of years to, for the Grand Canyon to be created by water. It was one day. God made everything in one day. You know, he made all this in one day, he made this in one day. And Grand Canyon, when he made the, the land appear from the waters, this is when the Grand Canyon appeared that day. This is the timetable of the Lord. From Adam to Noah was 1,656 years. From Noah to Abraham was 430 years. And from Abraham to Christ was 2,000 years. And from Christ to us now, it's been over 2,000 years. It was a 2,030, 2,050, but it's been over 2,000 years. And so the earth, the universe, it's a little over 6,000 years. If you go by God's timetable here, and you, get all, you can get all this in the Bible if you go through all that work. I didn't go through all that work. I read a book that said, okay, from this time to this time, and that's how I know. But it is in the Bible. You can find this in the Bible because where I read it, the guy showed the time periods. He showed them. He didn't say it. He showed them. So we know that the earth is only a little over 6,000 years old. But scientists make it a million years old. Right. Why did the Lord take six days to create everything? You know, he's God. He could have done it in one day. He's God. But he didn't. You might say, well, why? Well, if we look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within, within the gates. For in the sixth day, now the word for you could put because there. Now he's telling us why he did it this way. For in six days, or because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now we know that the Lord didn't rest the seventh day because he was tired. Like I showed a while ago, all he did was, was say it. All he did was speak it, and it was created. So we know he wasn't tired. Plus the scriptures show, Psalms 121.4 says, Behold, he that keepeth Israel, which is the Lord, shall neither slumber nor sleep. God never sleeps. Also in Psalms 33, verse 6 and 9, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. So he just did it by, his, by speaking. He didn't do anything physical. He just spoke it. Uh -huh. now, who gets tired from, from just speaking things out? Verse 9. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. So all the Lord had to do was speak these things. It wasn't like he physically had to do work to do it. And he rested. Why did he rest? Not because he was tired. He rested because he was finished. Amen? <laughs> See how... <laughs> is the Bible simple? I mean, really, it is really simple. We make things so complicated. He rested because he was finished. You know, when you're finished doing something, what do we do? We, that's it. It's finished. You stop. <laughs> I, I just proved that it wasn't because he was physically tired. Yeah. So he, fin he, he rested because he was finished. On these days, we'll keep it holy. Which means every day is the Lord's day. Every day is the Lord's day. Every day is holy. Every day is the Lord's day. We worship the Lord every day. At least that's what we should, we should do. Christians, that's what we should do. And if you're not doing it, now you know this is what we should be doing. The true Jews, the believers, and the Lord, 
they did pray and worship every day. They did. Every day. They worshiped. The, they didn't have a Sunday where, okay, on Sunday they got together and worshiped the Lord. No, they, they worshiped the Lord every day. And even the non-believing Jews who were very religious, even they worshiped every day. They were worshiping the wrong God, but even they were worshiping every day. You'll read that in the Bible. And we are to work at least six days. If you have a job and you can do your job in four days, that's fine. But we are, we're to work at least six days. Now, these verses I just read, does it say anywhere in those verses that the Sabbath is a day to go to church? It doesn't say that nowhere in there. It doesn't say anything about going to church. Verse 11 says, to rest on the seventh day. To rest. Not to go to church. It says, to rest. If anyone comes to you and says Sunday is the Lord's day or Sunday is the day you're supposed to rest, just tell them in a nice, kind, Christian way, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> the Lord's day is every day, like I said, every day. Day of rest is when you're off of work. If you work Monday through Saturday, then Sunday could be your rest day. But what if you work from Sunday to Friday? Then Saturday is your rest day. But the Lord says we do have a day of rest. He made these bodies, he made them, so he knows these bodies need at least one day of rest a week. So we should obey that. But to make it on a Sunday? In fact, do you really rest on Sundays? Some of these churches you meet in the morning, you meet in the afternoon, that you gotta get up early, go to Sunday school, go to worship, you know. I don't call that resting. <laughs> resting to me is sleeping late and relaxing, not doing anything that day. To me that's resting. That's right. Not having to get up early, get dressed get the kids ready, whatever. That's not resting. I hope you all understand what I'm saying here. Sunday is not a sin to work on Sunday. It's not a sin. Because Sunday is not the Lord's day. Every day is the Lord's day. I hope you receive that. God said the rest of the seventh. God said he rested the seventh day because that's what he, that's what he did. And he did it to be an example to us. Just like Jesus in Matthew's chapter 3, verse 13 through 15, when he, went to, when he went to get baptized by John, verse 13 says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus, and Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So Jesus, what Jesus was saying here, I'm doing this because to fulfill the scriptures and to be an example that we should get baptized when we give our life to the Lord. And just like Jesus did that there, he said, I'm doing this as an example for everyone else to do. That's what God was doing. When he said he rested the seventh day, that's what he wanted us to do, to, se to follow him the same way, to rest on the seventh day. Amen? Amen. Verse 6, And God said, Let there be firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters now firmament means atmosphere the reason I know this because in verse 20 it says the birds that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven so that's the atmosphere that's the sky well that's what we're talking about verse 7 and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Now God put some water above the atmosphere, and he put some water below it. There's no way I'm going to explain what this is, <laughs> what this means, because I'm, I'm, uh, you might can have some scientists that can explain this and understand it. I don't. I'm not a scientist. Now I'm talking about, remember I said there are scientists that are good scientists that can show and prove things. But then there are scientists like I'm teaching against, that's what I'm talking about. But right here, I'm not a scientist and I can't explain how this is. How this is. Maybe Jody can. She's a chemical engineer. I don't know if they did that in school or not. <laughs> but verse 8, And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, there's three heavens in the Bible. This is one of them, the atmosphere. It's called, the atmosphere is called a heaven. And then the second one is the stars, the universe, the sun, the moon. That's, that's called heavens also. And then, of course, the third heaven 
is where our God lives, is where we're going to be when we go to be with the Lord. That's our heaven. But there's three heavens. I wanted to point that out. In verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. As we read, water was over the whole place. The earth, water was over the, over all the land. And now he's bringing up land, earth. Earth was there, but it was covered by water. Now I'm saying all these things because I'm going to be using these after a while so you can understand. So that's why I'm reading all these verses. Verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. Right here we're, gonna, we're, we're learning that the evening and the morning, that's the way God put it. He said, and in the evening and the morning was the first day, second day, third day. Now, in Israel, with the Jews, the day began in the evening. Their evening was like our mornings. So God said, and it was, it was that way with them because that, that's the way God put it. He didn't say, and the third day was the morning. The morning and the evening was the third day. He said the evening and the morning was the third day. So God, to God, the day began in the evening. At six, say six o'clock in the evening. Verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, and divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. He made the days and the nights for signs, he said. For signs. Now we know what seasons is. You know, he made so we have our winters and summers and stuff like that. And for days and years, that's to keep track of years and days. That's what he made that for. But you're thinking signs. He made them for signs, well, yeah. In Numbers 24, it was predicted that a child would be born. Talking about Jesus, how the star. That was a sign. In the book of <coughs> Revelation, it says that the moon and will turn blood red and the sun will stop shining. You remember in Egypt when the Lord blacked out the sun for three days? He made it as a sign. So we see signs, that's what he's talking about. Now what he's not talking about, he's not talking about horoscopes. To the Lord, horoscope is evil. And we'll find that in Isaiah 47 verse 13, which I'm going to read out of the Living Bible. All the advice you receive has made you tired. Where are all your astrologers? Those stargazers, you know, those who look up to the sky, who make predictions each month. Horoscope. Let them stand up and save you from what the future holds. Let them stand up and save you. Sorry, they're not going to be able to. In verse 14 it says, those who do this will not be able to help you or save you. So, when it says signs, it's not talking about horoscope. If you read horoscopes because you want to know what's going to be that day or whatever, you're wrong. Horoscope in God's eyes are evil. And I'm going to read 15 through 26. But like I said, I'm reading these only because later you're going to see why I read all this. Because I'm going to be talking about them. Verse 15. And let them be for lights in the firmament and the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and divided the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath of life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great wells in every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and after 
<clears throat> and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning was the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now remember I showed you that John 4 verse 24 said that God was a spirit. And right now, right here he's saying, <clears throat> let's make man in, in our image. Well, what he was saying, now before Adam and Eve sinned, before they ate of the fruit, there was no sin. So Adam and Eve had no sin, just like God. They didn't have dying bodies, just like God. God doesn't die. Adam and Eve would have never have died because death would have never have come unto the earth. So he made them in, in his image. That's what he's talking about. They were perfect just like him. He was God though, but they were little perfect people. Okay? They were innocent. But now he has an image and we know that image is, well, Galatians 1 verse 14 and 15, in whom we have redemption through his blood and even the forgiveness of sin. Now who did that? Jesus, right? And it says, who is, talking about Jesus, who's the who? Jesus. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now by these verses we see that God was an invisible spirit, but now he's taking on an image, and that image is Jesus. Right? God became flesh, John 1.14. God became flesh. He was a spirit. But then he became flesh. So now we, Hebrews 1-2, it says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So he's talking about his Son, Jesus, made the worlds. So Jesus, we see that Jesus is God. That's what I get. And this is not the only place. I have several other scriptures to show that Jesus is God. Right. Well, right here, you can see Jesus, the man, but you can't see Jesus, God. We understand that? Jesus, Son of God, we can see. Yeah. But Jesus, God himself, we can't see. But that's the image we're talking about. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, this is the sixth day we're reading about. So we see here that he created Adam and Eve on the same day, right? Well, believe it or not, there's preachers out there. Now we're talking about preachers, not just scientists who go against the Word of God, but now we're going to, I'm going to talk about some preachers here. So you have preachers who say Eve was made for Adam because Adam was lonely. Yeah. And that's why God created woman to be a mate to him. Because he was lonely. But when you read the Bible, the Lord didn't use the word mate. He said he created woman to be a help meet, to meet Adam's needs. He wasn't lonely, for one thing, because they were, they were created on the same day. The same day. So how could he be lonely? Mm -hmm. And not only that, they weren't, women aren't made, were not made to be our mate. The Bible plainly says women were made to, be, to meet our needs. The word is meet. M-E-E-T. It's not M-A-T-E. Read the scriptures. It's M-E-E-T. He made women to meet our needs. Not because we were lonely. Like some preachers say. That's wrong. Verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, here's the first commandment that God gave to man. 
He told us to replenish the earth. He said to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish. Now again, he's talking to Adam and Eve, right? God did not say for man and man to have sex and replenish the earth. Can man and man have sex and replenish the earth? No. Can women have sex with women and replenish the earth? No. It's a sin for a man to want a man or a woman to want a woman. But right here it's shown God told man, male and female, man and woman to replenish the earth. So God uses man and woman to replenish the earth, not, not the other way around. It says that God told them. The them is what it says in verse 27. Male and female. Amen? Amen? We just need to read these things to see if something is sin. Man with man, that's sin. Women with women, that's sin. God told them, male and female, to replenish the earth. Women, you want to know what God's will is for you? It's right here. Have babies. We're to help, but you have the babies. <laughs> that's what he says. God told them to... Now, this is a command. God told them to have sex and have babies. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. It says, do not deprive... We're talking about a, a husband and wife. That's what we're talking about. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourself to more completely to prayer. Afterwards, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Husbands, fulfill your duties to your wife. She's in the mood, take care of it. Wives, fulfill you, your duties to your husband. If he's in the mood, do your duties. Amen? Amen. Now, if, if one of them is sick, well, the Lord gave us common sense. If your wife is sick, then you know, don't make her have love, make have sex with you. She's sick. Or vice versa, if the husband. It says here, the only, not complete that, do your duties only if you want to go into fasting and prayer. And then he says, when you're finished, to get back together again. Women, I have a headache. He doesn't want to hear it unless you really have a headache. <laughs> Alright? Now, again, the Lord says to get back together again. As soon as the fasting or prayer is finished, get back together again. I believe the Lord is mainly speaking to the husband. Because we're more physical of a turn on, where women are more emotional, emotionally turned on. But he made us to get excited. He made us to be sexually active. He made us that way. So after a while, when we don't have sex for a while, he knows, okay, <coughs> we're going to be hungry for it. So that's why he says, hurry up and get back together. So Satan won't tempt us with someone else. Amen? That's what he's saying right here. Read the verses. Go home and look at it again. Read it again. But that's what he's saying. Now, you have men who say, life was here before Adam and Eve. Because the Lord said to replenish, to replenish the earth. Now, replenish, if you read the definition of replenish, it does mean to refill. But if you read it... If, it also means to fill, to stock, or to make full. Now in this verse right here, of course, it's talking about to, to fill the earth. To fill the earth. Now, there is a place where replenish means to refill. And that's in Genesis, Genesis 9.1. This is after the flood. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and, and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, right here, it does mean refill because the earth did have people before the flood. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The replenish I'm talking about here, above, it means to fill. He told Adam and Eve to fill the earth. Noah and his sons, he told them to replenish, meaning refill the earth. But you have people who say, because of what it says, he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Of course, they're saying, well, you see, there were people here before them. Because of the word replenish. But I just showed you. Look it up in the dictionary. See what that word means. Right. Verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. 
which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Now the word meat here does not mean meat like animals. The word meat here just means food. No one ate meat before the flood. It wasn't until after, after the flood that God told Noah and his sons that they could eat meat. And that's in Genesis 9, verses 1 through 4, if you want to go there, if you want to read that. But that's, that's the first place where God said they could eat meat. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressively, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience sneered with a hot iron. Forbidden to marry and commanded to abstain, commanded to abstain from meats. Now here the word meats does mean animals, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature, creature, not fruit, every, for every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So God is saying right here, it's okay to eat meat now. Just be thankful for it. He says, give thanks for it. But at the beginning, they didn't eat meat. Verse 30, it says, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. Again, meaning food. He's given this the greens for food. And it was so. So same thing with animals. Animals did not eat each other. Animals did not attack each other and eat each other. It's the same thing. People and animals ate grass, greens, fruits. Same thing that's going to happen in the millennium. So if you're thinking, man, I, I couldn't live back then. I, all I could eat was fruit and, and greens. Well, I guess you're not going to like the millennium either because all we can eat is, all they're going to eat is fruits then. Why? Because in the millennium it says the lion will lay with the lamb. So animals won't be killing each other. So we won't be killing the animals to eat them. And they're not going to be killing each other to each other. So the millennium is going to be just like it is at the beginning. We're going to eat greens and fruits. Amen? Amen. Some of us will say amen. Some of us will go, oh man, I can't eat no meat. <laughs> Verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning was the sixth day. God said everything he created he did, and these six days, these six days were very good. Now, if God said it was very good, that means it was perfect. Perfect means it can't get no better. Perfect means it's at the top. If you can do anything to it to make it better, then it's not perfect, right? Right. But God said everything was very good, so it was perfect. Anything that man says or do to me to 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 mean some other, something else to it, to try to make it better. When God says it's perfect, you can't do any better than perfect. Amen. If you do anything, all you're going to do is bring it down because you can't take it up because it's already perfect. And this is what men do. This is what men, scientists, man, they try to make it seem like, oh, this is, no, no, it was already perfect. Man, man is the one that messed it up. We ate the fruit. And from then on, it just went down. Everything was perfect up until then. Yeah. Like I said, Adam and Eve, they would have lived forever. But because of sin, death has come into the picture. You know, God does heal. People, you know, you pray for people, they don't get healed. Well, God doesn't heal. No, He does. Because we were dead. The Bible says we were dead. Even though we were alive and breathing, but God says we're dead. And He healed us. Yeah. Now we're alive. So God does heal. Amen. Amen. Now, listen. Scientists say water has been coming out of the earth, coming out of the earth for millions of years. The Bible says the earth was covered with water. So how, you know, they said, no, we got our water from coming out of the earth. God says in Genesis 1-2 that the earth was flooded with water. It was just water. I think the scientists are wrong. They say life began in the sea. This is what scientists say. Life began in the sea. Genesis 1.11 says the first life was on land. was the plants. 
You know, plants and trees, they need, that's life. So life began on land. They say it began in the sea. They say that fish and other marine orgasms were here before the trees. Genesis shows that God made the trees on the third day and made the fish on the fifth day. I guess these scientists don't read the Bible. No. I mean, I mean they can't. Fish came before the trees? Uh, no, read the Bible. Trees were here on the third day. Fish was on the fifth day. Amen. Do we see, are we seeing how simple God has made the Bible for us to read? Really, in fact, it is so simple, we don't get it sometimes. He's made it so simple, we don't see it. Christians, we see it. Christians who read the Word of God in the Spirit, God will reveal to what He's showing us. But people who, who are lost and they try to read this, they're not, as simple as this is, they're not going to see it. They say that the sun and the moon are as old as the earth. That's what scientists say. But we read that the sun and the moon was made on the fourth day and the earth was put here by the third day. So earth was here on the third day and then God made the moon and the star on the fourth day. So how can they say that the sun and the moon is as old as the earth? God told Adam to have dominion over the animals. Scientists say that animal, animals were already extinct, extinct a million years before men even got here. And God told man to have dominion over the animals. And they're saying this. Scientists are saying that creation is still continuing to be evolved. But it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 and 3, verse 1 through 3, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Was finished. Does that say it's still evolving? No. no. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. Ended it. He rested on the seventh day from his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So, is creation still continuing? When God says right here several times, it was finished, he stopped, it was over. But they say it's still going. If I'm making the scientists seem stupid, it's not me. <laughs> it's not me making them sound stupid. Right. It's them doing stupid, saying stupid things. Making themselves look stupid. Now, scientists themselves, we need to pray for them. They're lost. They don't know the Lord. We need to pray for them for salvation. But we don't believe the words they say. Because like I read up above, it will cause others to, to move from the faith that they had been taught. So these things that they teach, we shouldn't, we shouldn't allow ourselves to listen to it. And we shouldn't allow our kids to listen to it. And that's why a lot of Christians have home Bible study. Because they don't want the kids to go to school and learn that we came from apes. Or that the earth is a million years old. That goes against the word of God. In fact, you cannot be an evolutionist. You cannot be a scientist and say you're a Christian. You can't. They don't go together. They're going completely against Genesis. How God created everything. They're going completely against it. That's against God. Amos chapter 3 verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? The Lord is saying, how can we walk together if we're not in agreement? So these scientists, these evolutionists, who may call themselves Christians, how, they can, how can they walk with God unless they're, unless they're in, in agreement with Him? I'm not here to just call them stupid, which they are. But I'm not here for that. I'm here to show us when we have men out there who say these things to us, we can come back to them and say, no, the Lord said. Or people who might be saying it because they, this is what they were told, so now they're telling us, but if we can show them what the Bible says, then they go, oh, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Because you showed it to me. But what I was told by the scientists, it's just an assumption of what he's saying. It's just a theory he has. Now, what are you going to believe, a theory or the Word of God, which is truth? Yeah. Amen? Amen. 